Hello, my name is Patricia Butler and I'm a climate change outreach specialist with the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science. I'm here today to share with you some of the results from the vulnerability assessment for forest ecosystems in the Central Appalachians region. First, I'd like to introduce you to the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science, which is a multi-institutional partnership. Our charter members include three branches of the Forest Service, the Northern Research Station, the Eastern Region, and Northeastern Area State and Private Forestry, and also non-federal institutions including Michigan Tech, the National Council for Air and Stream Improvement, the Trust for Public Lands, and the College of Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resource Sciences. Our mission is to develop synthesis products foster communication and pursue sciences in the focus areas of climate change, carbon science, and bioenergy. We do this in order to bridge the gap between scientists and managers, who are often the first people to use new science. And because climate change is not just a challenge for any one agency, we're commissioned to help a range of federal, state, tribal, and other natural resource managers put knowledge into practice. The U.S. Forest Service has been a driving force behind understanding climate change on a regional scale, and their contribution to helping landowners adapt to climate change recently expanded with the unveiling of the USDA Regional Climate Hubs. NIACS is leading the Northern Forest Subhub, and the Climate Change Response Framework contributes products such as the Central Appalachians Forest Ecosystem Vulnerability Assessment to the hub efforts. The Climate Change Response Framework began as a pilot project in northern Wisconsin in 2009 and has since expanded to cover six regional project areas. In each area, a unique assembly of land managers, scientists, and others lean on the structure of the framework while providing local relevant information to resources and examples of adaptation. The vulnerability assessment for the Central Appalachians describes a landscape with a high degree of variation in climate, landforms, and natural communities. How climate change affects these natural communities will depend largely on landscape position, soils, hydrology, and their inherent ability to overcome change. After we understand the range of potential climate change impacts on our ecosystems, we can use another set of resources, the forest adaptation resources, to help guide us to implement this information and choose actions that can help us respond to climate change. Another component of the framework is demonstration projects, um, which are also known as real-world examples of how these tools and resources can be put together by different landowners um, using different management objectives and goals. So for the next 30 minutes, I will give a brief overview of the vulnerability assessment so that we have a good understanding of what it does and doesn't do, as well as highlight um, some insight into the process used to assess vulnerability. Then we'll explore some of the past climate changes, as well as projections of how climate may continue to change in the future. We will also look at several forest impact models that help us understand how individual forest species may respond to changes in climate. Finally, we'll look at the results of putting it all together. In what ways are our forest ecosystems vulnerable to climate change and also climate variability? So again, this assessment is meant to evaluate forest ecosystems and their key vulnerabilities and adaptive capacity. Because models are only an educated guess at best about their magnitude of change, the assessment presents a range of possible future climates, from a mild degree of climate change to one that is expected to seriously disrupt natural and human systems. And the document is written with your average forest manager in mind, one that is aware of topics related to climate change, but is not necessarily a climate scientist. Likewise, the modelers involved with this effort incorporate feedback from managers to adjust and correct model results based on local expertise. It's important to point out that the assessment 
focuses on vulnerability to climate, but not necessarily to changes in management, land use, natural resource extraction, or other major policies. And it does not make recommendations on what you should do to implement this information. The vulnerability assessment simply provides a baseline of information. The forest adaptation tools and resources I mentioned earlier provide a process that helps land managers incorporate this information into making decisions. If you're interested in taking this a step further, please don't hesitate to contact me and I can help point you to those resources. This vulnerability assessment was created using a process that not only pulls together recent scientific literature on climate impact models, um, but also draws on the vast knowledge and expertise of land managers, academics, and scientists who work directly with forest ecosystems in question. An expert panel is critical in this process to help identify model limitations, identify local caveats, and to weigh each ecosystem's expected impacts and adaptive capacity in order to rate vulnerability. We also evaluate the quality and quantity of information at hand to rate our level of confidence in each assessment. There are almost 50 individuals from a diversity of organizations in Ohio, West Virginia, and Maryland that have contributed to the vulnerability assessment process. These include the Appalachian Landscape Conservation Cooperative, the Appalachian Mountains Joint Venture, the Kekapan Institute, uh, the Ohio, Maryland, and West Virginia Departments of Natural Resources, and particularly the forestry divisions within those um, various universities, Ohio State University, West Virginia University, the Monongahela and Wayne National Forests, Northeastern Area State and Private Forestry, and many others contributed um, time, energy, and information to make this a highly relevant document for the central Appalachians. The region that describes the central Appalachians area is shaded in the map shown. These boundaries are a mix of ecological and political boundaries. To map the ecological boundaries in this area, we use the United States Forest Service ecological subregions of the USA based on the national hierarchical framework of ecological units. The area covers about 29 million acres and supports a variety of landforms and accompanying natural communities. For that reason, many of the climate models and observed climate data have also been summarized by ecological section, including the six ecological sections shown here. The assessment covers a majority of the forest cover within these states. Broadly speaking, oak hickory types dominate the landscape, although there are many other types of forest communities occupying specific niches in this complex landscape. The way that climate changes across this landscape will be quite varied also. Um, data used to make the maps that I'm about to show you um, have been downloaded from the Nature Conservancy's Climate Wizard, and you can download the same data from www.climatewizard.org. These maps show changes in average annual temperature over the period 1901 through 2011, which is the most recent data we had available at the time of analysis. Over that 110-year period, minimum temperatures have risen the most by 1.1 degrees Fahrenheit when averaged across the assessment area. As averages go, you can see from the map that as some places warmed by 5 degrees, other places may even have become cooler. Maximum temperatures have cooled at various locations within the assessment area, but even so, the increases in minimum temperature have were so great that they contributed to overall increases in mean annual temperature. The stippled areas on the maps, or the little black dots that you see, indicate statistical probability, where we have a high confidence um, that temperatures have, in fact, been changing. Narrowing in on seasonal changes can be particularly important for understanding how species might respond to those changes, as climate is important for determining many aspects of the life cycle of plants. 
in winter, minimum temperatures um, are more yellow than blue with some red and orange areas indicating increases of up to four degrees. Maximum temperatures are mostly decreasing in the winter, closing the gap between high and low temperatures. Winter nights are just not getting as cold as they used to. Temperatures have increased in spring across large areas, again with significant increases shown in the stippled areas. Again, it's the minimum temperatures that have warmed in many locations, um, but temperatures have also cooled up to three degrees along the Ohio and West Virginia border. Maximum temperatures have also warmed in areas by two or three degrees. Summer minimum temperatures have increased the most. Minimum temperatures, again, um, have increased in this case by 1.6 degrees Fahrenheit when averaged across the whole assessment area, but have already warmed by as much as five or six degrees in those uh, most red-colored locations. Maximum temperatures have cooled by two to three degrees in many localized areas, but overall the mean temperature, the mean annual temperature, has warmed by two to three degrees, with nights again generally just not cooling off like they used to. And again, it's minimum temperatures that have changed the most across the assessment area in the fall by 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit. This shows up as increases of four to five degrees over much of West Virginia with hot spots that have increased by up to seven degrees Fahrenheit. So long-term records show us that minimum temperatures have been increasing over the past 110 years. So why was it so cold this winter and the winter before? Is it true that the polar vortex is throwing us into the next ice age? This chart simply illustrates the natural fluctuation of temperatures from year to year. In this case, minimum temperatures throughout the assessment area averaged for the whole year have increased by 1.1 degrees Fahrenheit, even as temperatures fluctuated from year to year by as much as 6 degrees Fahrenheit. Precipitation observations are also notoriously variable especially in high relief areas like the central Appalachians where rain is captured on one side of a mountain or another. From 1901 to 2011, there were significant increases of up to four inches with some local drying as much as four inches in the Allegheny Mountains. It's important to consider your local normal for precipitation. In places where annual precipitation can be as much as 40 to 50 inches per year, Four inches only equals about a 5% deficit, while in other areas it could equal 10% or more. Winter shows some drying over large parts of West Virginia with two and a half inch deficits in some areas. Only Ohio has really seen some increase over the last century, notably in close proximity to Lake Erie. Spring precipitation has increased in many areas, which is great for plant growth. That surge in precipitation, however, is followed by a decrease during the warmest part of the growing season, uh, notably in the Allegheny and Northern Ridge and Valley sections of West Virginia and Maryland. The lake effect zone of northeastern Ohio has again increased during the summer. Fall is particularly notable for significant increases in most locations, and overall a 0.8 inch increase averaged across the area, and up to two inches more rainfall in specific locations. Climate Central data confirms that states within the assessment area are among the 10 slowest warming states over the 1912 to 2011 period. Remember, our data started in 1901. As you can see in the top map where Ohio and West Virginia and Maryland are shaded in green, um, this indicates essentially no change over that time period. Since 1970, however, warming has become, began accelerating everywhere, even in states that were already warming. 
the 10 fastest warming states since 1912 heated up twice as fast in that period since 1970. The 10 slowest warming states have started warming 60 times as fast. So we also looked at the 1970 to 2011 data within the central Appalachians. Summer stuck out as the season with the most change. Mean temperature rose by 1.5 degrees on average, while minimum temperatures rose by 2.3 degrees on average in those 41 years. Remember the average over the 1901 to 2011 period was 1.6 compared to that 2.3 degree increase. Just to point out, the maps on the left are actual changes, while the maps on the right indicate statistical significance with the areas showing in purple um, statistically significant. Averages can tell us a lot about general changes in climate, but it's also important to recognize that extremes are not evident in those averages. Extremes such as heat waves, droughts, floods, and hurricanes are just as important. In earlier slides, we saw that precipitation increased by up to four inches over the last century. The timing of precipitation events has shifted, however, and intense precipitation events have become more frequent, while light rain events have not. Throughout the U.S. during the last 64 years, there was a 30% increase in the frequency of days with extreme rainfall. In West Virginia, the frequency has increased more than the national average. It has increased by 50%. At the same time, we have observed longer periods without any rain between these higher rainfall events. And this can overwhelm the soil's ability to absorb moisture, resulting in increased runoff and erosion. Other indications of change include that snowfall has increased over the same period in the lake effect area of Ohio likely due to the warming of Lake Erie, which results in less ice cover, exposing the water to evaporation. Ice on inland lakes is also breaking up earlier in the spring and forming later in the fall, with a shorter overall ice duration. A recent study exploring trends in spring onset dates showed that spring has been occurring later by four to eight days um, in the fall since the 1950s. Uh, it has not been occurring earlier in the spring, but it has been um, extending the growing season um, by expend, ex extending into the fall. Population declines of purple martin are linked to an increasing mismatch between spring arrival dates and the timing of food availability. Birds that are migrating from the Amazon basin to sites in Pennsylvania and Virginia are not able to leave earlier in order to take advantage of food resources that are appearing earlier in those locations. The trends that we have observed over the last century, and especially over the last 50 years, are expected to continue or to even change dramatically. There are several methods that are commonly used to investigate potential climate change. Some groups choose one model and run with it. Other groups choose to run numerous models and scenarios over multiple simulations and then use the average as the best possible estimate. But because we simply don't know what the future will bring, NIACS and our partners are dedicated to understanding the full range of potential futures. Our methods for examining that range is by taking the available models and climate scenarios and choosing two of them, what you might consider the best case scenario and the worst case scenario. Two models, PCM and GFDL, represent the lowest sensitivity model and the highest sensitivity model to greenhouse gas emissions. And the low emissions scenario, B1, represents the lowest greenhouse gas emissions scenario, while A1FI represents the highest greenhouse gas emissions scenario. And we combine the low emission scenario with the low sensitivity model 
and the high emission scenario with the high sensitivity model to give us the widest range possible in potential climate futures. So what does this look like in the central Appalachians? These maps summarize changes at the end of the century using a 30-year average of climate data over the period 2070 to 2099. These data were downscaled by Catherine Hayhoe and her team at the University of Texas. And in order to investigate how the end of the century is different from our current climate, we subtracted that 30-year average from the 30-year average climate normal represented as 1970 through the year 2000. We also have maps available in the vulnerability assessment um, that display changes in the early part of the century and also the middle part of the century. We also have data that break averages down for each ecological subsection that I mentioned earlier. So if we look at the annual temperature, the models both agree that temperature will increase in most places, but disagree about the magnitude of change. Under PCMB1, models project that annual average temperature increase by two to four degrees, depending on location. Under GFDL A1FI, those increases in temperature are projected to be much more alarming, up to 10 to 12 degrees Fahrenheit. It's also important to point out that as you look at these maps, I would discourage you from focusing in on any one pixel, as this is really meant to be a fuzzy estimate about the magnitude and direction of change. But the lines on this map are unlikely to translate to actual lines on the ground. There isn't much seasonal variation um, in future projections like we saw in the past climate data. For the winter season, the difference between the two models is lower during any other season. PCM projects winter temperatures to increase by up to 4 degrees, while GFDL projects increases of 4 to 8 degrees. Spring looks much like the maps of mean temperature under the PCM scenario. Ohio is projected to increase from 1 to 2 degrees in many places, shown as the bright yellow, and from 2 to 4 degrees in other places, the more orangish gold color. Under GFDL, the change is much more extreme, ranging from 6 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. The most projected warming occurs under the GFDL A1FI scenario for every season, but slightly more so in summer and fall. In summer, temperatures are projected to increase by as much as 12 degrees under GFDL A1FI. When precipitation was averaged for the whole year, we saw that the PCM projected increases across much of the area, while GFDL A1FI projected increases in many places, but decreases in some places. When these increases or decreases occur during the year can have important implications. So seasonal averages can tell us much more about potential impacts on vegetation. Models agree that precipitation will increase in winter and spring, more so under GFDL A1FI than under PCMB1. But models disagree about how precipitation will change in the summer and fall. Under PCMB1, precipitation is projected to increase in the summer and decrease slightly in the fall. Under GFDL A1FI, precipitation is expected to decrease substantially in the summer and increase slightly in the fall. Although there is quite a bit of uncertainty about the exact magnitude and timing of these changes, we can consider the potential implication of a slight to substantial decrease in soil moisture 
availability during the summer or fall. There is also a clear trend toward more extreme precipitation events as well as a more episodic regime. Models predict two to four more days of extreme precipitation for the central Appalachians and eight to ten more days um, that are dry per year. Year-to-year -year variation is also likely to increase. Models also project 20 to 30 more hot days described as days over 95 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century, as well as an increase in the number of multi-day heat waves. Decreases in late summer precipitation and increases in temperature drive models to project increased frequency of drought across the region. Based on temperature, the growing season, as defined as days without frost, will increase by one to two months across the region. So what could this mean for the forests of the central Appalachians region? Well, it's not going to be all bad news. Some of the potential benefits to forests include longer growing seasons, which could increase the productivity of forests if there is no limitation on moisture or nutrients. Models consistently project increased precipitation during spring, but decreases during summer or fall. Models such as Landis Pro and the Climate Change Tree Atlas have worked closely with us and have used the same climate data that I just presented in order to explore the response of individual tree species in a changing climate. And unfortunately, we don't have time to go into each of these interactions in great detail, but you can find much more information in the published version of the vulnerability assessment. And it's not all good news either. Here's a starter list of stressors related to climate change for forests in the central Appalachians regions. Models have projected a number of disturbance factors to increase. Um, some of the same things that were seen as a benefit to forests due to climate change, such as CO2 fertilization, um, again, could be a stress on forests um, as certain plants are known to acclimate to CO2 fertilization and are limited by water or major nutrients. Extreme weather events um, and damage from those events can have a much stronger immediate impact on forests and trees, individual trees, um, than long-term climate change. Longer growing seasons, especially um, within an altered hydro hydrologic regime, um, can impact um, forests. Changes to that hydrologic regime um, are expected to increase in more frequent drought as less available, it, less water is available for um, tree species to use during the growing season. And with warmer temperatures and those stresses placed on trees, the populations of pest and disease agents are expected to increase, as well as the susceptibility of tree species to those pests and disease agents. Likewise, the ranges of invasive plant species are expected to increase. And with changing soil conditions and a number of other factors, we can also expect the frequency and intensity of fire to increase. In order to help us understand potential impacts on individual tree species themselves, we will use, we used forest impact models, which generally fall into one of two main categories, species distribution models and process models. We use at least one of each to provide different kinds of information about potential impacts on forest composition, tree species ranges, and productivity. 
Climate Change Tree Atlas is a species distribution model that incorporates current information about a tree species' life history, abundance, and distribution on the landscape, and incorporates the same climate models that I showed you earlier to predict where a species habitat might occur in the future. Looking at this map, we can see the current distribution for sugar maple based on FIA data. Under PCM B1, which is the mild climate scenario, the potential habitat for sugar maple is relatively similar. We can see some decrease um, to the southwest of the assessment area, um, but largely the importance value and the coverage of of suitable habitat for sugar maple remains the same. Under the GFDL A1FI scenario, we can see that the suitable habitat for sugar maple covers a much smaller part of the range, and where it does continue to cover that range, it's shown as a much less important species on the landscape its abundance um, will likely be diminished where suitable habitat remains. For chestnut oak, um, which covers a large southwest to northeast um, gradient currently within the assessment area, um, the PCM B1 model shows again very little change um, and maybe in some parts, um, even slight increases. Um, and then in GFDL A1FI, we see a decrease in potential suitable habitat, habitat for that species. Um, but again, that species still does fairly well and is, still remains an important species on the landscape. We can also use a model called linkages, which is an ecosystem process model, um, to describe species establishment probability. So if we look at these maps for species establishment probability, um, the one on the left is for sugar maple, and that orange color describes um, no change in species establishment probability. The one on the left representing model results for um, the high emission scenario, GFDL A1FI, shows a large decrease in suitable habitat. Um, and the blue color um, represents extirpation across the region. Um, the red color represents a large decrease. For chestnut oak, um, we see that there is largely no change over most of the assessment area under the low emissions scenario and even an increase in the Ridge and Valley section. Under GFDL A1FI, chestnut oak is projected to decrease in species establishment probability um, in the red areas, but again, under the high emission scenario, um, increase in that northern ridge and valley section. Linkages results get fed into the process model Landis Pro, which shows us potential changes in biomass. Um, and we can look at changes in basal area for individual species, and we can look at changes in trees per acre. Um, so, for example, if a tree species has a large increase in basal area, it helps us to know if the number of trees per acre are increasing, which would signify that trees are regenerating and younger age classes are appearing on the landscape. Um, or if trees per acre are decreasing, which would represent the growth of um, legacy trees that are remaining on the landscape. 
So we can look at um, results in Landis Pro for um, 17 species within the assessment area and looking at um, year 2010 through year 2110, um, many of the changes that we see um, are quite mild in terms of changes in biomass. Um, and this is what we would expect to see. Um, in context of changes in suitable habitat and species establishment probability that we saw, um, tree species are unlikely to hit 2100 and all die off immediately. Um, they are likely to continue to thrive um, even in unsuitable locations um, and maybe start to lose um, the ability to regenerate um, uh, very slowly over the next couple of hundred years. Um, and so changes in biomass are likely to um, occur long after the time frame of this assessment. So if we look at potential changes in basal area for the species white ash, which is shown as the green line, um, the third from the bottom, we can see that in the year 2010, um, the width of that line represents a certain basal area. And as we go out over time, through the year 2050, 2060, um, when we begin to enter 2080 and 2090, the width of that line starts getting thinner. Um, and what that represents is that the basal area um, represented by that species on the landscape is getting smaller. And this is what we would expect to find for um, white ash, which uh, not only is projected to lose suitable habitat from the climate change tree atlas model, but is currently being decimated by emerald ash borer. And if we look at the graph for trees per acre and we look at, again, um, white ash, we can see that the number of trees per acre on the landscape um, starts off relatively small in 2010. Um, it's pretty steady with um, minimal declines um, through the end of the century. Um, and that just represents that um, the number of trees that are currently on the landscape um, are likely to represent the same number of trees um, in the future. So when the results of all three models are compared and contrasted under both emission scenarios, they agreed on a common set of potential winners and losers. In section M221B, the Allegheny Mountains, um, all three impact models generally agree that biomass and suitable habitat um, for American beech, eastern hemlock, uh, sugar maple um, will remain stable through the end of the century under the low emissions scenario, but decrease under the high emissions scenario. Um, and although model results weren't available from all three models for red spruce and balsam fir, um, results suggest that red spruce and balsam fir are also potential losers. Results again suggest that although these species will lose suitable habitat um, and growth potential, established individuals are likely to persist shifting the biomass um, to larger, older trees. Uh, these species are vulnerable to direct changes in precipitation and temperature, um, but are also susceptible to stress, um, beech bark disease, hemlock, woolly adelgid, um, drought, um, and a number of other indirect um, impacts of climate change. 
Um, some of the potential winners are species um, that currently exist um, largely to the south and west of the assessment area, species that tend to like warmer, drier climates. Um, so these are a lot of the oaks and hickories black oak, chestnut oak, pignut, hickory, scarlet oak, white oak, post oak, um, shortleaf pine, and flowering dogwood. Um, model results for all three models are available in the appendix of the vulnerability assessment, um, as well as um, results for each ecological section. Um, for example, if you're managing forests in northeastern Ohio, um, we can, you can find model results summarized for just that area in addition to the entire assessment area. The results of the impact models and climate projections, um, as well as a wealth of scientific information on these natural communities, um, was considered by about 20 expert panelists during a two-day workshop in Morgantown, West Virginia. That information, along with their own expertise um, in management and research, contributed to a process that we used to assess the vulnerability of nine forest ecosystems. These nine forest ecosystems are based on approximately 30 ecological systems originally described by NatureServe, um, but they have been modified to become even more specific and relevant to the assessment area. Research um, specialists and authors of the vulnerability assessment have helped compile, review, um, and refine, refine these systems while recognizing the diversity within this area is high um, and that there are literally hundreds of varieties of these ecosystems occurring at different locations on the landscapes. Um, for the purpose of assessing vulnerability, we were able to lump um, forest ecosystems into these nine main types, including um, a northern hardwood forest um, with sometimes a large hemlock component, um, dry calcareous forest woodland and glade communities, dry oak and pine oak forests and woodlands, um, dry to mesic oak forest, large stream floodplain and riparian forests, mixed mesophytic and co-forests, north central interior beech maple forests, which are um, pretty limited to the Ohio portion of the assessment area, um, small stream riparian forests, so a lot of the forests that occur along the smaller meandering um, low velocity streams in the assessment area, and then the high elevation spruce fir forests. Um, so at this point, I'll present just a little teaser of results. Um, and again, these are broad determinations for broad ecosystem types across the whole central Appalachians region. Um, for each forest type, participants at the expert panel in Morgantown first considered all the positive and negative potential impacts on the forest. We then considered any factors that would contribute to the forest's ability to tolerate those impacts, um, which we call adaptive capacity. Then the overall weighing of impacts over adaptive capacity gave us a measure of vulnerability. In the vulnerability assessment document, we go into detail about which impacts and adaptive capacity factors were most important for that forest type. This gives us valuable information that can help us figure out why a system is vulnerable and later inform how to overcome challenges um, that climate change creates for management. So um, we have determined that the northern hardwoods, the large stream floodplain and riparian, and the high elevation spruce fir forest ecosystems uh, were rated the highest vulnerability in this region, while small stream riparian 
and dry calcareous systems were rated moderate high. Mixed mesophytic cove, north central interior maple beach, um, were both rated moderate vulnerability and dry music oak and dry oak and pine oak types were rated as low vulnerability. So let's take a closer look at one of the forest ecosystems that had vulnerability rated high. This is the northern hardwoods forest community um, which extends um, across the central Appalachians region but in some locations can contain nearly homogeneous stands of hemlock. The ecosystem extends from southeastern Ohio all the way to the higher elevation mountains of Maryland and West Virginia. It occurs on soils which tend to be less acidic um, the canopy is generally composed of your typical northern hardwoods such as sugar maple, American basswood, beech, white ash, um, with lesser amounts of black cherry, yellow birch, sweet birch, red maple, tulip tree, um, and minor other species. Sites on the more acidic soils are usually dominated by mixtures of yellow birch, beech, black cherry, um, red maple, and uh, eastern hemlock. Panelists considered potential impacts on the drivers of this system and considered increasing temperatures and decreasing precipitation to be the most threatening to this moisture loving system. Additionally, models projected that some of the most dominant species, um, which are American beech, eastern hemlock, um, sugar maple, tulip tree, black cherry, white ash, and red spruce, um, these are all species projected to decline across much of the assessment area. Um, in addition to the direct effects of climate and precipitation stresses on this system, a number of um, indirect effects including uh, increased drought frequency and duration, um, pest and disease outbreaks, um, and wind and fire disturbances um, are becoming, are likely to become more important stressors on this system. In terms of adaptive capacity, um, this system generally has a high number of tree species to begin with, which allows risk to be spread among a higher number of species. However, this type is geographically limited um, to high productivity soils. Um, and the combined effects of climate change, acid deposition from which it is currently rebounding, um, and increased temperatures and drought um, actually result in low adaptive capacity. And the combination of high potential impacts and low ability for this system to overcome those impacts has resulted in a rating of high vulnerability. And we have, in addition to rating the vulnerability of all nine forest ecosystems um, in the vulnerability assessment, we have developed broad statements of expected impacts on drivers and threats for the entire region, um, as well as general statements about the region's adaptive capacity. Um, and so, in general, we have found that um, systems that are at greater risk on the landscape can include low diversity systems simply because they do not have a number of species should one species fail um, to rely on. Losing a species in a low diversity system is likely to significantly change the identity of that system or um, transition that system from forest cover to non-forest cover. 
Species in fragmented landscapes um, are also at greater risk as species are pressured to move around on the landscape. Um, the higher number of barriers um, and changed land uses will make it more difficult for species to find newly available habitat niches. Um, and species that are limited to very specific hydrologic or cool temperature regimes are unlikely to find habitat in any other place in the assessment area than where they currently exist, generally at the highest elevations. In short, some systems have no place else to go. On the other hand, systems at lower risk um, include systems that uh, have adapted to a high level of disturbance or even depend on disturbance in order to regenerate. Um, these systems include fire adapted ecosystems which often occur on nutrient poor, well drained soils and can tolerate um, warmer, drier conditions, um, and those conditions can in turn promote um, certain oak and pine species um, to establish and regenerate. And also systems that are currently occupying multiple positions on the landscape have greater opportunities to move in multiple directions to seek out newly available suitable habitat as conditions continue to change. The vulnerability assessment, um, again, is one component of the larger climate change response framework, um, which really relies on partners from the forestry um, and scientific communities to continue a dialogue on climate change um, impacts and responses. Um, and if you have appreciated the vulnerability assessment results that I've presented um, today, you can go to forestadaptation.org, um, click on the Central Appalachians link, um, and you can find the vulnerability assessment on our website if you would like to take a closer look. Um, if you would also like help incorporating this information into your forest management or planning activities. Um, there are tools and resources available at our website. And there are over 50 examples of how forest managers on different landowner types from federal to state to tribal um, to private landowners have used these resources and gone through the process to incorporate climate change into what they're doing on the landscape to respond to climate change. Those examples um, are available under demonstration projects and I encourage you to um, read how your neighbors on the landscape are, are responding to climate change. And here's my contact information. Please don't hesitate to contact me or anyone at the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science. Thank you.